Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is the winner's curse. This one's really interesting, but we actually need to review something that we covered previously to fully appreciate the result. I want you to recall back to the time we talked about second price auctions. You'll recall that a second price auction is a situation where the auctioneer solicits sealed bids from everyone involved and then looks at those sealed bids, awards the prize to the highest bidder, but only has the high bidder pay the second highest price. So for example, if you and I were the only bidders in the auction, I bid $70 and you bid $50, then I'm the winner of the auction because I had the highest bid of 70. But rather than paying 70, the auctioneer charges me the second highest price, which is your bid of $50. What we saw in these second price auctions is that it's an equilibrium for every player to submit their true value of the good. So instead of having to think strategically about what I'm going to bid and best respond to it, or about what a third party is going to bid and then best respond to that and so forth, instead, it's a dominant strategy for you to take a step back, think to yourself, hmm, what is the highest price I am willing to pay for this good? Write that on your slip of paper and then submit it to the auctioneer. There's an important caveat for the conditions under which this is an equilibrium, however. And that caveat is that the value of the prize needs to be independent. Lots of things follow that. For example, if I were auctioning off a autographed copy of Game Theory 101, the complete textbook, how much you value that has no impact on how much your friend Frank values it, which has no impact on Barbara from Canada's value for that object. And that's true for a lot of consumption goods, like a textbook. What it's not true are for things that have common values, things that you're planning to resell, for example. A couple of really important examples of this, in fact, are oil deposits and sports-free agents. If you're trying to buy an oil field, you're not going to purchase that and then consume it. You don't have this consumption value directly for having an oil field. You don't think to yourself, ah, I'm so happy I own an oil field. If you have an oil field, you're happy because you can extract the oil out of the ground and then sell it. So if there's more oil out there, that's going to increase both of our values for that prize. Same thing with sports free agents. The better a player is, the more value each of us has for that player. And what we're going to see is that bidding your true value for the prize at stake is not going to be a smart idea when we have common value items at stake which is not the case with independent values. Independent values, just submit your own true value. Don't do that for common values, though. And let's see why, and this is going to be called the winner's curse. So here's a common value auction. We have an oil field out there that could be worth nothing at all. It's very expensive to extract the oil out of the ground. It could be worth $25 million, or it could be worth $50 million. $50 million, hey, it's really easy to extract that oil. It's going to be great. It's going to be really profitable. The $0 outcome, that's going to be one-fourth of the time. The $25 million outcome is one-half of the time, and the $50 million outcome is one-fourth of the time. We're going to have two bidders participate in a second price auction to buy the field, and we'll have a tie be determined by a coin flip. What's critical here, though, is that each of the players doesn't know ahead of time what the true value of the oil field is worth. They have this prior belief that it could be $0, $25 million, or $50 million, with the probability distribution I've illustrated there, but they don't know for sure which it is. However, before the auction starts, they receive a signal about the value of it. So they don't just have this prior belief, they also can have someone go out and look at the oil field and check to see how expensive it's going to be to extract the oil. Unfortunately for these companies, that message is not crystal clear. They don't know for sure after receiving the report whether it's a $0 oil field, a $25 million oil field, or a $50 million oil field. They instead receive a noisy signal that it either has a low value or a high value. And the way the signal is going to work is as follows. If the field is worth truly no money at all, both will receive the low signal. If the field is worth $25 million, one bidder will receive the low signal, and one bidder will receive the high signal. And finally, if the field is worth $50 million, both receive the high signal. 
This is a Bayesian game. We have two types for each player, a low type and a high type. So the equilibrium of this game is going to require us to find a bidding strategy for each type of each player such that the bid is optimal for the type. And what I mean here by a type is the signal that is received by the player. So we both start off identically, but what's going to differentiate us from other types is that I'll either get a low or a high signal. And when I have a low signal, that makes me a distinct individual from someone who had received a high signal. So what I'm bidding as a low type must take into account what type of bid I would make as a high type, which in turn is going to impact what you as a low type or you as a high type is going to bid. It's a symmetrical game though, that's the good news. And so really if we find the bidding strategy for one player, we'll have found the bidding strategy for both players. This might be a good time and opportunity uh, to actually try this out on your own, to think about what your expected value is if you receive a low or a high signal and what you may then want to bid. And if you want to pause the video for a moment, go ahead and do that and try to work out, maybe think about what you should bid and what you shouldn't bid and why it might be a good idea and why it might not be such a good idea. But if you're ready to press on, let's take a look at what would happen if you followed the tidbit or the advice that I gave you previously on second price auctions, which was to bid your true value. So let's think about what your expected value is after you receive a signal, starting off with a low signal. So imagine that you receive a low signal. What is the probability that the oil field is worth $50 million? Well, think about that for just one second. That's actually trivial. It's a trick question. It's impossible. If the oil field is worth $50 million, you'll never receive the low signal. Well, now let's think about what happens if you receive the low signal and you're trying to figure out what the probability is that the oil field is worth $25 million. Well, I taught you previously how to calculate that. You can use Bayes' rule. The prior probability the field is worth $25 million is one half. The probability of receiving a low signal given that the field is worth $25 million is equal to one half. The prior probability the field is worth $0 is one fourth. And the probability of receiving a low signal given that the field is worth nothing at all is one. You're guaranteed to receive the low signal if the field is worthless. So those are the four components that we would need to be able to implement Bayes' rule. And that's exactly what I'm doing here. So we have the probability that the field is worth $25 million times the probability that you get a low signal given that the field is worth $25 million. And then you divide that over every single way that you could receive a low signal, which includes the probability that it is a $25 million oil field, times the probability of receiving the low signal conditional on that, just as you see in the numerator. But then you also have to add up the other possibility, which is the probability that you get this low signal from a situation where the field is worthless. So that's the probability the field is worth nothing times the probability of receiving a low signal given that the field is worth nothing. And that probability will give you the probability that you have a $25 million field conditional on having received the low signal. And to do some simplification there, this actually turns out to be a very simple fraction. It's just one over two. So the probability of having a $25 million oil field conditional on having received the low signal is one half. All right, now let's think about the last possibility. So you still received that low signal. What's the probability that the field is worth nothing? Well, you can use Bayes rule just as we did previously and you would get the same answer as if you just observed that it must be one half. Why must it be one half? Well, there's only three possibilities out there. It's either a $50 million oil field, a $25 million oil field, or a worthless oil field. We know that the probability that it's $50 million is zero. We know that the probability that it's $25 million is one half. And so because all probability distributions have to sum to one, that means that the remaining one half must fall on it being a worthless oil field. So we can combine all of that information together to extract an expected value of the oil field conditional on having received the low signal. So it's one half times $25 million plus one half times zero, which is equal to 12.5 million. Implicitly here, there's another zero times 50 million, but of course that just cancels out immediately. So if you were to bid your 
true value for the oil field, having received a low signal, well, it would be $12.5 million. That is your belief on the value of the oil field having received the low signal. Now let's do the same thing for what would happen if you received the high signal. If you receive the high signal, what is the probability that the field is worth nothing? Well, again, that's a trick question. It's impossible. If you have a high signal, can't possibly come from a field that's worth nothing. If a field is worth nothing, then both players receive a low signal. It's impossible to receive a high signal in that case. What about it being worth $25 million? Well, again, we use Bayes' rule. We know that the prior probability the field is worth $25 million is one half. We know the probability of receiving a high signal given $25 million is one half. We know the prior probability the field is worth $50 million is one fourth. And we know the probability of receiving a high signal given that it's worth $50 million is guaranteed. It's a probability of one. So you can take all of that information and sub it into Bayes' rule just as we had previously. And this would give us your posterior or your updated belief using Bayes' rule on the probability that the oil field is worth $25 million conditional on having received the high signal. And if we do a little bit of simplification after we substitute those values, well, then we just get this equal to one half. Very simple. The last possibility is that the field is worth $50 million. And again, you could use Bayes' rule to arrive at a probability that this is true, but like before, you can easily observe that this has to be a probability of one half because the other two possibilities are probability zero and probability one half. All probability distributions have to sum to one. So the remaining probability that's missing is one half. And there you go. So that means we can now easily calculate the expected value of the oil field having received a high signal. And that's going to be one half times 25 million plus one half times 50 million which is $37.5 million. All right, let's think back to that second price auction rule that I gave you. If you bid your true value in a second price auction, that would mean that a type that receives a low signal would bid $12.5 million, and a type that receives a high signal would receive $37.5 million. My question to you is whether this is an equilibrium. And again, this might be an opportunity for you to pause and work this out on your own. If you didn't get very far previously, I've given you a lot of hints on what the uh, strategies are in particular here in this uh, equilibrium that we're alleging may or may not be true. So now that you have those strategies in front of you, it'd be a good opportunity to pause and consider whether there is a profitable deviation for either the low type or the high type. And if you're ready, we will now see that it is not an equilibrium just as I have been alluding to all along. And to demonstrate that, we're going to use the hint. We're gonna look at what happens if you're the low type and you bid $12.5 million according to the strategy. Well, if you receive that low signal and you bid 12.5 million, two outcomes are possible from here. Half of the time, the field is actually worth $25 million. If that's the case, we know that the other player will receive the high signal and bid 37.5 million. You are outbid in this case, so you lose the auction, the other player wins, you get nothing, you pay nothing, your payoff is zero. The other half of the time, the field is worth nothing. If that's the case, the other player also receives the low signal and bids $12.5 million. They're doing the exact same thing that you're doing, which means that when the auctioneer receives those bids, there's a tie. The tie is determined by a coin flip, so half of the time you'll lose and get nothing, and then the other half of the time, you'll win, in quotation marks, the worthless oil field and pay $12.5 million. So this should be a, making a little bit clearer what the problem is here and why this is not going to actually be an optimal equilibrium. So to summarize this information into actual values, some numbers for the overall payoff, half of the time, the other player receives the higher signal and outbids you, so you get a payoff of nothing. The remaining half of the time, they also receive the low signal. They also bid $12.5 million. Half of the time, you win that coin flip. So you win that $0 oil field and you pay $12.5 million. The other half of the time, you lose the coin flip, which is actually 
winning the coin flip and you get nothing, which is better, again, than if you had won the coin flip and paid $12.5 million for a worthless oil field. So your overall payoff here is a negative $3,125,000. That, again, is negative. And you can see why there's a profitable deviation now. If you're the low type, you can start this game off by just saying, you know what, I'm bidding nothing. I don't care. I bid nothing for this oil field. And if you do that, you are making it literally impossible to get a negative payoff. And that's better for you than following the strategy given where you bid $12.5 million having received that low signal. So that you have a profitable deviation and that prof profitable deviation is to simply bid nothing whatsoever. All right, what went wrong here? Well, winning implies that you received the highest signal. But conditional on winning, the value of the prize is lower than what your signal told you. Because by virtue of the fact that you have won the auction, it is more likely that the other person has received the low signal. And if the other person has received the low signal, that should make you update your belief that you don't actually have as valuable of a prize in front of you as you previously thought. So this is what's called the winner's curse, which is that if you're bidding not according to what you're expecting to receive, but rather what you expect conditional on the signal, you're going to be hurting yourself. You're gonna be paying a lot of money for something that is not as valuable as you thought, and in this case, actually getting a negative payoff for having done that. That's actually going to wrap up this half of the mini series on the winner's curse. And we're going to see in the next lecture that there's a solution to this problem, which is to simply bid conditional on winning what your expected value is for the prize, not your expected value having received whatever signal it is that you received. So I hope you enjoyed this and hope to see you next time where we talk about what the equilibrium strategy is for this game, what some general properties are of the winner's curse, what you should do when you have lots and lots of bidders out there instead of just one, and whether this problem actually occurs in the real world. So again, hope you enjoyed this video and I hope to see you next time. Take care.